So I'm Jack Simons. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Utah. And I have here a series of uh, lectures on electronic structure theory. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about in these series. First of all, let me explain to you who it is that I'm trying to talk to. Um, primarily, I'm talking to PhD students who are maybe beyond their first year of graduate school. And they've taken the normal first year graduate classes. And they're interested in electronic structure theory, perhaps. They might want to be professionals in that area, or they might want to utilize that in some of their research efforts. I also am talking to my experimental friends who uh, are interested these days in using electronic structure methodologies to help interpret and guide their experiments. Or they often have graduate students in their group that they want to have do some calculations for them. And I think it's important for them to have a way to understand better what's really going on with these electronic structure programs that they're using, and what are the strengths and limitations there. The third group of people I'd like to talk to are in the theoretical chemistry community. There's many graduate students these days who are working in what we call simulations. And they work on biological molecule simulations or new material simulations. And they know a lot about statistical mechanics or molecular dynamics, but they don't know much about electronic structure theory. And they sort of take it somewhat for granted. So I want to try to educate them uh, better as to what are the, the uh, methodologies and the strengths and weaknesses of various electronic structure methods. The people I'm not talking to are the real experts in electronic structure theory or the students and postdocs who are becoming the experts there. Uh, you're just not my primary audience, but if you want to listen along and try to pick up some extra keys from, uh, from these lectures, that, that's fine with, you, with me. For those, that group of people, I, I understand when you look at these lectures, you'll say, oh, there's much more elegant ways that he could have said this, or there's a more mathematically sophisticated way that he could have done this particular thing. I know that, but the people that I want to talk to primarily are these other individuals that I just introduced you to. And their mathematical backgrounds are usually not as sophisticated as people who are going to become professional theoretical chemists. So I have to couch the uh, description of what I'm talking about in languages that they can understand, not so that you experts can understand it. So I don't care about you so much, I'm sorry to say. <clears throat> now before I go any further, there's, there's some other sources of information that I wanted to just introduce you to. Because in these lectures, I'm really just uh, exposing the tips of some icebergs in the various uh, things that I'll be talking about. And I found some three books that I just want to show you that I think are excellent ways to go beyond the tip of the ice iceberg and look and see what's underneath the surface. In my opinion, the best book that's available today was written by Trikva Helgekar, Paul Jorensen, and Jeppe Olsen. And it's this book that I'm showing you right now, Mole Molecular Electronic Structure Theory. It's expensive, so you may not want to buy it, but try to find if your library has it. And it has really a cutting edge treatment of the subjects. <laughs> Another book that I wrote a long time ago with Paul Jorensen, so it's by Paul and myself, is called Second Quantization Based Methods in Quantum Chemistry. And it's a rather short introduction to, in particular, using what are called second quantization, creation and annihilation operators, that appear in some of the electronic structure theory um, literature and terminology and lectures these days. And then f finally, I wrote a book with my colleague Jeff Nichols, who's now at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, called Quantum Mechanics and Chemistry. And this has, I think, a good sort of overview of the different methodologies that I'll be talking about. And then finally, there's a web page that I have written this called um, Theory Page. And it's on my website, which so that would be http colon slash slash Simons dot hec dot utah dot edu slash theory page all one word and on that website you'll find information that will help you also now in these uh, series of 12 uh, lectures or sessions here they, they range from about 20 minutes in length up to a little bit more than an hour and in these 1 through 12 sessions as I call them I treat various aspects of electronic structure theory in session 1 I go back to the basics and I say in, that all of electronic structure theory can be thought of as arising from, we use the Schrodinger equation, quantum mechanics, to treat the motions of electrons and nuclei in a molecule. So it's sort of from first principles. Now there's various approximations that arise in, in this uh, treatment. There's a so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation. There's the idea of potential energy surfaces and orbitals. And these things appear in session one. In session two, we talk about the Hartree-Fock approximation, and Coulomb and exchange interactions, and Koopman's theorem, 
things like this. So we're actually then at, in session two talking primarily about orbitals and hartree fock Session three, we introduced the concept of electron correlation, where electrons try to avoid one another by dancing. That is by saying, I'll be on this side of the molecule while you're on that side of the molecule because we have the same charge and we like to avoid one another. So that's, that's electron correlation in session three. In session four, I get a little bit more specific and talk about how we express molecular orbitals in as a, what's called LCAOMO, linear combination of atomic orbitals to give molecular orbitals. So we get molecular orbitals by the hartree fock approximation by using these so-called atomic basis functions, and we introduce Slater and Gaussian basis functions. Then in session five, I spent a short session five describing the different jargon and, and nomenclature that's used to describe these basis sets because in the literature you hear about 631G and augmented correlation consistent polarized valence double zeta basis set and all this jargon has to be explained and the reason and physical underpinnings of the uh, different bases that's what I treat in session five. Then in session six we talk about using um, what is called miller plesset perturbation theory to describe electron correlation. In session seven we talk about what's called multi-configurational self-consistent field and configuration interaction methods instead of molar plesset perturbation theory for treating electron correlation. Then session eight treats what's called couple cluster, which is sort of the gold standard these days, the highest level treatment that most people use to treat electron correlation. Session nine contains some interesting tricks that we need to study uh, negative molecular ions, which is something that my own research group has been interested in for years. And these techniques are useful when one has a problem with what is called variational collapse. There's a, a difficulty that arises in particular in studying negative ions. And in this session nine, I, I describe some tricks to avoid these problems. Then in, in a brief session 10, I go through some trends that one observes in treating a, a large number of molecules when you look at how do the errors that you uh, re, that you obtain in calculating things like bond lengths and bond angles and energies of reactions uh, and transition state energies and things like this. How do those errors depend systematically on the basis set size and on the kind of method you use to treat the electron correlation? So you get some idea of if you want a certain error range, then you must use this basis set and this methodology. And then in session 11, I talk about one of the more, uh, say, timely topics that people are interested in these days, density functional theory because it looks like it's a new methodology that can sort of revolutionize the field. But it's not yet mature, so I try to give a balanced pro and con treatment of this subject. And then finally, in session 12, I talk about what is usually called response theory. And this means how does one treat not just the energies and wave functions of molecules, but their responses to, for example, molecular deformations. And those responses give rise to, for example, vibrational frequencies, and reaction paths and transition states and chemical reaction energy barriers and things like that. So that's what I treat in, in session uh, 12. So that's the end of the introduction. Now let's get going.